Good afternoon, this is Trish Safner, uh, Yukon Advanced Master Gardener. I'm in the garden here in Thompsonville Community Gardens. And this afternoon we're going to be talking about best organic practices. This is very important to me. This is something that I've put together over several years of working with gardeners, working with organic farmers, and it's something that I use to help gardeners start a garden, whether it's something small or something large. It helps them get off to the right start. Uh, the first thing that I recommend is really to plant what you love to eat. And when you do that, you'll always have fun in the garden. So by looking at what you like to eat, the next thing is you're going to do is to research those plants. What you want to do is find out what specific needs they need to grow in your area, what kind of light conditions they need, what watering conditions, and certainly if they're going to grow in your area. The other aspect is that you need to find out if they have any problems or pests or diseases that you can help prevent using organic methods. And so all that information gives you the tools to have a successful garden. The first thing that you want to do after you have that information is actually find out whether your soil is ad adequate enough to grow in. And what I recommend as a Yukon Master Gardener is to get a soil test. A soil test is very easy to find. You can go online at the Yukon um, Master Gardener website or you can go down to Yukon and get one. And what it does basically is it tells you the health of your soil that you're beginning to garden in. It's going to tell you the pH, it's going to tell you the organic matter, it's going to tell you the macronutrients that are in the soil. And once you get the soil test back, it gives you information on how to improve the garden soil so that you'll get the best produce coming out of it. You can also tell them whether you're going to use the garden soil for flowers, for herbs, for vegetables, or for lawn, and they'll give you the specific recommendations for those. And so that will be your guideline for the next several years, and you'll do repeat soil tests after a few years to see how things have changed. So once you know what plants you want to grow, once you know the condition of your soil, you're now ready to make a plan for growing. Um, that plan can take several months or it can happen right away. Right now we're in June, people are very anxious to get in the garden and to grow things and eat right away. It doesn't always happen that way. Oftentimes planning is the best way to get the best results, but you can certainly give it a try the first year. What I recommend is that you start the plan in the cooler months. So in late fall, in, in December, in the winter months when you have time, you're going to take that soil test, you're going to read the recommendations, you're going to follow what they direct you to as far as whether the soil needs implements, um, something to increase the pH, something to um, improve the organic matter like compost, and that allows the winter months for all those components to break down into the soil to feed it, and so it's ready when you start to put your seeds in it in early spring. So once you've taken that information, um, you want to sort of make out a plan of what you would like to eat and when you would like to eat it. Following the recommendations on the plant seeds uh, packets or uh, from your local nursery where you're getting your plants. So once you have a plan together, you want to go outside and just check to make sure you have enough space to grow the plants, that you have the, light, the right recommendations, um, whether you have a water source nearby. These will all ensure that you have a great gardening season. Uh, once you get your research down as far as your plants, um, you can put together your plan for when to put the seeds in the ground, when to put the transplants in the ground. Um, and at this time you want to start a journal. Um, a journal can be just something simple where you're writing down all the steps that you've taken so far, what your soil test indicates, what kind of plants you want to grow, what are the recommendations for those plants. Um, the journal also should include the weather conditions. It's a good idea to go out every day and actually record the weather conditions, the temperature, the clouds, the sun, the rain. All these things are very important for your future growing season. So even though it might seem like it's an extra step, I find it's a great way to look back on your growing season. If you've had successes, you see why. If you've had failures, you see why. You can then refer back to the information on the packet, the recommendations for growing, and see why your particular plant or plants didn't do well. Um, you then take that journal and continue to add into it. 
what things you've noticed in the garden as you're observing. Are you seeing pests? Are you seeing that things are growing slower than they were recommended or faster? Or if there's any other problems, write it down in your journal. Because in February, when you're planning next year's garden, you're not going to remember what happened in July and August. But you, if you have it in print, you will be able to easily see what worked and what didn't. And then you can modify your plan for next year. Because I know you're going to want a garden next year, too. So once you've gotten all those things together, you want to gather the gardening supplies that you'll need. The seeds, the tools. Um, um, any other thing that you might need when the weather starts to get cold, such as row cover and hoops if you want to continue to grow into the cooler months. Uh, the potting soil. Um, and you want to get these things early in the season, generally early spring, because these things tend to go out of the stores that supply them. As you get into the summer months, they're starting to stock other things. And you won't have all, all the implements that you need if you don't if you wait until the last minute and you go out and get them. So by gathering all these things in the early spring, you can just go ahead and garden and concentrate on enjoying yourself. So you want to plant according to those recommendations. Um, these are recommended on the seed packets by scientists and gardeners who have been doing this for decades. They've learned the best way to grow an herb or a flower or a vegetable and use that information to help you so that you don't make mistakes or have a disappointing time in the garden. Um, once you get your plants in the ground and you're happy the way they look and you're watering them appropriately, you're watering them at the soil level, the next thing is to think about weeds. Whenever you start to disrupt the soil, that allows weed seeds to germinate. Once the sun now gets to those seeds, the rain gets on them, they're going to start to take over if you have a lot of open space in your garden. Um, to combat this, I recommend natural mulches. Natural mulches such as clean grass clippings, chopped up hay, chopped up leaves, they all serve to cover the soil that's not planted, to retain moisture, and to add organic matter. Um, they'll also prevent the weed seeds from popping up so that you'll have less work, less labor as the summer goes on. The other thing besides natural mulches is companion planting. I've talked about that before. I find that it's very important to create a diverse ecosystem in the soil by planting herbs and flowers. What they will do is they'll bring in beneficial insects and they'll also add nutrients to the soil as your plants are growing. So the natural mulches, the companion planting of low growing plants like alyssum, like thyme, like chives, flowers, they will all cover that unplanted area and continue to feed the soil nutrients. Um, so you're observing your plants, you're writing down recommendations um, and, and problems and successes in your journal. You're thinking about how you want to plant for next year. And you might even be thinking about wanting to plant later in the fall to harvest during the colder months. So these are all things that you're keeping in mind. You're going out daily. You're looking on the underside of your leaves to see if there might be any pests there. Um, you're observing the climate. Are you following that all of a sudden we've got six days of cloudy weather? Now maybe you're making an association that your plants aren't growing well. Is it something that you did? Probably it's more likely the climate. So you can also be on the forefront of noticing climate change by going out and observing what's going on outside and in your garden. Um, harvesting is the next part. It's the fun part. Um, it's the part where you get to take in nourishment. Um, you get to thank the plants for providing food for you. And um, you get to enjoy all the hard work and labor that you've been doing. All those things that you dreamed about in February when you were writing down recommendations and writing in your journal. Now you actually get to eat things. And then once you start eating from it, you're going to start feeling good. And once you start feeling better, you're going to want to do more of this. The physical activity, the outside movement, um, getting your hands dirty, it's all going to add to beneficial and longer life. So harvesting will be according to your plant. Um, some days you'll harvest a lot, some days you won't. Again, it's going to line up with what the weather has been. If you are growing warm season plants like tomatoes, squashes, cucumbers, they're all going to thrive on 85 degree days. If we have a long spell of cool, cloudy weather, 
everything slows down and it also invites disease and pests to come in. So those are all things that you're going to need to look out for. Um, and as you're going through and harvesting, you're also looking at the plants. You're taking away any uh, broken branches or twigs or um, any diseased leaves. You're removing them and um, either placing them in the trash or you're placing them in your compost pile. The compost pile is also a big part of your garden. It's going to hold your debris um, as you're cleaning the beds up and you're also going to be using that compost maybe later in the season, maybe next year, to add as a supplement into your soil for next year's garden. Um, you're also going to consider at the end of the season maybe planting a cover crop in that you're going to cover the soil with either a grain such as uh, rye or oats or legumes such as clover or hairy vetch and what those do is they'll capture the nutrients from the air into the plant, they'll hold it in the soil roots, and those nutrients will then be available for your plants next season. Uh, they'll also prevent erosion. Um, they'll also continue to feed the soil microbes throughout the, the um, early growing season when you haven't planted yet. So by using all these principles, you'll be able to enjoy your garden, you'll have less labor because you will have been thinking of feeding the soil, not feeding the plant. Um, you'll get the physical activity and of course you'll enjoy the nourishment of growing plants. So these principles can be used in a small garden when you're first beginning or they can be used in a larger garden or even on a farm. They've worked really well for me and um, I hope they work for you. So we will see you next time in the garden. We'll be talking about soil fertility. Have a great day.